Hey folks, can you see me and hear me now? This has been a struggle this morning. Uh, so, but I think, uh, let's see if we're working. I've tried my iPad, I've tried my phone, I've tried my laptop. Now we're in a different uh, mode on my laptop and seeing if that will do it. So if anybody can hear me and see me, um, please let me know. It's Becky here at New Hampshire Audubon, and uh, I'm hoping we've got things working again here. Uh, oh, hey, Lisa, thank you. Yay, it looks like it's working. Okay, great. Sorry so much for the delay, everybody. Wow, that was a long shot here. Um, I couldn't get the microphone to work, and every time I selected the right microphone, the uh, screen went black and disconnected the camera. So... Thanks for hanging in there for those of you who did. Uh, it's Becky with New Hampshire Audubon, and I'm here to answer any questions that you've got about birds or other natural history topics. Um, I'm uh, here with some books at hand so I can help uh, answer questions, and it's a really fun time of year um, because birds are nesting, and there's lots of activity with young birds and Birds are still building nests and they're feeding youngsters and it, there's just a lot happening out there. Uh, it's been very dry. I was out watering my garden this morning and um, and, and uh, we, we certainly could use a little rain, but the birds seem to be doing just fine and um, they are, they're going about their, their business of raising youngsters. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to send in a chat um, or make a comment, and I'll do my best to answer them. Again, it's Becky with New Hampshire Audubon. And I think the first thing I'll chat about right now is a little bit about baby birds, uh, because oftentimes we see a baby bird and we don't know what to do about it. So when it comes to baby birds, um, there are a couple of things that are really good to know about to, to start with. Um, one is that um, for most songbirds, both parents feed the youngsters in the nest and they grow feathers and then they oftentimes leave the nest before they can really fly very well. They'll grow feathers and they'll have feathers uh, and they may be able to flutter. Some of them could fly quite well, but some of them may just sort of flutter down to the ground. That's perfectly, perfectly normal. It's fine when they do that. And what happens is the parents continue to come and bring them food. And you should hear the young ones. They make a piercing noise constantly to be fed. That does a cheep, 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 cheep. And letting, um, letting their parents know where they are so the parents can bring food to them. So it's okay if they are not in the nest and they can't quite fly very well. Um, Humans don't make the best bird parents, so it's really good if we can allow birds, their regular birds, to the parents to raise the youngsters. Um, and so if you find a baby bird, and it, maybe it's not in a safe place, and, and you're thinking, oh, I should probably do something about it. Well, the best thing to do is to put it, um, get a, a box, uh, put it in a box and just move it into a bush, put the box on its side so the baby bird could come and go, so the parents can feed it, um, and then just put the, the box in a bush um, or low in a tree, just a little bit out of harm's way, and it'll continue to cheep, the adults will continue to feed it, and that's all perfectly normal, and that's the best thing to do with a baby bird. Um, and there are some times when you find youngsters on the ground and they're, they aren't, they don't have much in the way of feathers yet. And that could happen for a couple of different reasons. The nest could be raided by a predator. And when that happens, sometimes the predator um, gets some of the youngsters and, and others just get pushed out of the nest and onto the ground. If that's happened, um, particularly if it happens at night when the adult birds are there, 
then the adults may not come back or the adult may have been killed. So that can be a sad situation um, that does sometimes happen. And there's not that much that you can do about it, but there are wildlife rehabilitators that can care for orphan birds like this. And um, there's a number on our website and also um, New Hampshire Fish and Game has a list of wildlife rehabilitators on their website. Um, and it's by area, so you can tell um, which birds, uh, I mean, which birds, um, what um, rehabilitator may be closest to you. The other thing that can happen is that cowbirds lay their eggs in other birds' nests. And the cowbirds tend to grow faster, they get more than their share of the food, and they will actually push their siblings out of the nest so that they get even more food. So sometimes it may look like there's a bigger bird in the nest pushing out its siblings. And when that happens, it's probably a cowbird young and it's pushing out its foster siblings so it can get all the food. So all of those are natural processes that happen and they can be difficult to watch. Um, but nature does have its own way. And if you have an injured bird, a wildlife rehabilitator is the best person to call. They're licensed to care for injured and orphaned wildlife. But again, if that bird has feathers, if it's a baby bird that has feathers, then it's probably left the nest on its own and just needs to be moved to a safe place. And there's a lot of old wives tales out there about um, don't touch the bird, your scent will be on it, the adult will never come back. Um, that's not true. Most birds actually have very little sense of smell and, um, and they will continue to feed their young even if you have touched them. Now, sometimes if the nest has been raided and you put a bird back there, back in the nest, the adult may not come back, but not because you touched it, simply because there was a predator that raided the nest and either the adult was killed or the adult fears for its life and has abandoned the site. And that does happen. Um, so feel free to send in any questions, um, any comments you've got. Um, send them along and I'll uh, do my best to answer them. Uh, another thing I wanted to, to mention um, about nesting birds uh, is that sometimes they nest in the wrong place. And we've talked about this before, but they nest in places where maybe you don't want them. So um, one of the things that happens sometimes pretty regularly is a bird will nest in a hanging plant or in a wreath on the door. Maybe you've left your Christmas wreath up a little bit too long and um, you go to take it down and there's a nest in the wreath. Well, what do you do? Well, that's likely to be something like a house fincher or robin. And it's only a couple of weeks of incubation and usually a couple more weeks until the birds fledge. So if you can just leave them be, let them go about the process. And then one morning you'll wake up and there'll be no birds there and you can go ahead and take the nest down and uh, the wreath down. Um, the birds will not return to that nest at night to roost or anything like that. So you can just take the, the wreath down and that way the birds won't use it again for another nest. Uh, if you've got a nest in something like a hanging plant, uh, the best thing to do is just to continue to water it, give it a little bit of water on a regular schedule. The birds will get used to the disturbance. And if you don't give it too much water, the nest won't get flooded. And again, it's only anywhere from four to five weeks before the birds finish the process and are gone. Uh, so it can be relatively easy to, um, to let them go about their process and then continue on with what you are doing. Now, I got a call from somebody who had found a killdeer nest out in a, um, a ball field. And the killdeer is a type of shorebird, but it's actually not found on the shore. It's an inland shorebird. Um, they have long legs. They have two black bands on their breast. Uh, and they lay their eggs right on the ground. They don't build a nest or anything. They just have four eggs right on the ground. And they, um, they uh, 
the female will incubate them and then the young hatch and they can um, move almost immediately uh, when they hatch and so they'll run after the parents and they'll feed themselves. So if you have a situation like that, if you can just rope off a little area around the nest until the youngsters hatch and the adults lead them away, um, then the birds will be, be set. So sometimes just a little bit of protection is what's needed. And I wanna say hi to everybody. Um, I see, um, looks like most of you can see and hear me okay. I just remembered to scroll down on the comments. It, it, on this one, it doesn't automatically scroll for me, so I had to do it uh, manually. And so hi to everybody. Um, Irina have some really vocal ravens in our neighborhood. Um, heard it maybe because they're distracting predators from their nest. Well, at this time, the chatter is all about the youngsters. So raven chatter right now is likely to be coming from young birds that have fledged. They're pretty early nesters. They're on, you know, they're hatched by April usually. Um, so the youngsters are flying around and they're making a lot of noise. They're talking to each other, they're talking to the parents, and ravens have all kinds of different noises that they make, you know, oh, oh, and all kinds of, of funny, funny different sounds. I actually had a raven in my yard this morning and I haven't had one for a little while. Um, so those youngsters moving around, the adults are still, um, if they're not feeding them entirely, they're certainly providing supplemental food. Um, ravens will make noise when there's a predator around, um, but they're more likely to be actively chasing it. Like they'll chase a hawk away or an eagle away, they'll dive bomb them. Uh, so I think you'd hear sort of not just the chatter among birds, but a really active, determined noise uh, that, that sort of is an alarm. Well, it would be an alarm call, um, and you'd hear that. In fact, right now, um, not just ravens, but a lot of other birds will be doing alarm calls if they've got youngsters that are out of the nest. Again, they can't fly very well, and um, the if you or a cat or some other predator gets nearby, they'll be making a, um, a lot of little chattery noise. When, when the birds nest, they tend to be relatively silent when they've got eggs. Now, um, blue jays are known to raid nests, and so you may hear chatter when a blue jay is around a nest with eggs. Um, but otherwise birds tend to be pretty secretive when they actually have the eggs. And when the young hatch and they start feeding them more, the young get pretty vocal and will make lots of noises begging for food. Um, and then at, when a predator is around, the adults tend to make a lot of, of um, uh, warning noises. So you may hear them doing that. Um, well, and hi, Jess, and hi, Tracy. Sue, thanks for the feedback. And uh, Susan from Pentecook, hi, and Candy and Lisa. Thanks for all your feedback to let me know this is working. I apologize again for the delay. Um, I actually had to switch software. Um, so thanks, thanks for uh, hanging in there. Again, it's Becky with New Hampshire Audubon, and I'm happy to answer any questions you've got about birds or other natural history topics out there. We've just been talking about baby birds because we've been getting a lot of questions from folks about baby birds out of the nest, um, what to do, and uh, the, the best overall advice is to try and let the adult birds take care of things for themselves. As I keep saying over and over again, uh, humans do not make good bird parents. It, anything that we can do to make sure that the adult birds take care of their youngsters is the best thing that we can do with baby birds. Uh, so it, this is the end of June and it is peak breeding season for just about all the birds. Um, I was out last night looking at common nighthawks 
and they're a declining bird in the state. They're endangered in New Hampshire. Um, they're not endangered throughout the country, but they are in New Hampshire because we've had a strong decline in population. And they're a bird that is crepuscular, and that means that it's active at dawn and at dusk. And so I was out from about 8 to 10 looking for male nighthawks, which display very actively over possible nest sites. And they make a noise very much like a woodcock. It's a peep, peep, peep. And then they fly overhead. They do a flutter, flutter, fly. And then they do this big, let's see if I can get big, uh, big booming flight in a big U. Let's see if I back up. There we go. Oh, no, the other way. Uh, <laughs> it's a mirror view. <laughs> right, let's try this. Ooh. <laughs> All right, that's what the nighthawks do, the males do when they do a big dive and they make a whooshing noise with their wings at the very bottom of the dive where they pull them forward to pull up out of the dive. Um, so I was out watching for them last night. Nighthawks are not hawks, they're relatives of whippoorwills, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with. Um, and nighthawks used to be very common in our cities because they nested on stone roofs. Uh, but they're declining. They're declining pretty much all over um, their range, but particularly in New Hampshire. And one of the towns they're still found in is Concord. And another town is Keene, New Hampshire. And then we have a natural population up in the Ossipee Pine Barrens that's monitored. Uh, well, I do the monitoring, but the Pine Barrens is managed by the Nature Conservancy to maintain this um, rare habitat. So what questions have people got out there? Oh, yes, looking forward to when the building is open, so am I. I actually had to come in today because I couldn't get this to work at home. Turned out I couldn't get it to work in the office either. Um, the, uh, as most of you probably know, our trails are open at the, the center here in Concord and elsewhere at our, at our sanctuaries. Um, we do ask people to social distance when you're on the trails. Um, the building, we're working on a reopening plan, but we are um, considered a museum under those guidelines, and um, we're going to have to figure out how we might be able to accommodate those guidelines. But you can come here and uh, to the Center in Concord at the McLean Center on Silk Farm Road in Concord, New Hampshire, and you can walk the trails and you can see some of our captive birds. We have a bald eagle, we have a red-tailed hawk, we have a um, barred owl, a screech owl, uh, and a barn owl. So um, feel free to come by, take a look. We always appreciate any support you can give to help us feed and care for these birds and um, to help us keep our center and our trails open and going. Uh, the other thing you might want to check out when you're here is our pollinator garden. So let's chat for just a moment about pollinators. Um, most of us are familiar with honeybees, but there are lots of other native bees, solitary bees, and other insects that pollinate our plants. And um, there's a lot of evidence that their populations have declined. So we've got a po demonstration pollinator garden here at the McLean Center. And you're welcome to come. You, it's in our courtyard area and out in front of the building. There are signs on some of the, um, the plants, actually on most of the plants. And the garden is designed to provide uh, nectar and host plants for our the native pollinators. So please come take a look. Uh, Diana and I did a video that's on our Facebook page and on YouTube uh, with a little introductory tour of the garden that we did at the very end of May. And of course, more things have been coming out. Um, so please come take a look and hopefully you can get some ideas for your own garden. It's been very dry, so this has been a, um, a tough season to have new plants in the ground, but there are some great plants that are great for our pollinators and also look wonderful in yards. I've got a couple of them in my yard that I planted um, a year and a half ago and they're doing great. They look great. They're about to come into bloom and those blooms will, um, will attract pollinators. Um, but there's a lot that you can do to help the pollinators. And of course, we have to 
mentioned the butterflies as well. Most of us are familiar with mi planting milkweed for monarchs, and there's different kinds of milkweed. Um, there's butterfly weed, which is in the milkweed family that makes a wonderful garden plant. Uh, and it, it's the, um, the wild native milkweed has runners or the common milkweed, I should call it. There, there are a number of different wild native milkweeds, but the common milkweed has runners and can run a lot of different places. But some of the other milkweeds, swamp milkweed, the butterfly weed, will stay in one place and have a lovely flower for you to enjoy and also be a plant that the monarchs can use as a larval food plant. So when it comes to attracting butterflies to your yard, you want not only nectar, but also the host plants. And these are the plants that the caterpillars eat. Uh, so that can be a little bit tricky. Um, and there's a wonderful butterfly called a red admiral and their host plant is stinging nettles, which isn't necessarily something that you want to have in your yard. Um, so that can, that can be a little bit of a challenge to see if it's a corner where you can have a plant like that that nobody's going to run into and create a problem with. Um, uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, yes, check out the video and the garden is looking great. Diane DeLuca is in charge of that and she's got um, a group of volunteers that helps her with that. Uh, so if you're a gardener and are interested in volunteering, um, our pollinator gardens uh, would, would um, appreciate um, additional gardening help. So uh, the person to contact is Diane DeLuca and um, She's uh, got an email, d d e l u c a at n h org, and you can email her directly and uh, express any interest in being a garden volunteer. Really appreciate that. Uh, so, all right, what else have we got uh, going on now? What are people seeing out in their yards? It's a time when hummingbirds are are pretty active, and I've got one around my yard. Um, and they're the females, I don't know if folks know this, but they're, the males have a display area where they display and they mate with any female that comes there. There aren't hummingbird pairs. The female is the one who lays the eggs, incubates them, feeds the young, does all of that. The male will mate with as many females as he possibly can. So if there's a great, like a nectar plant, I happen to have um, a honeysuckle vine that they like to come to. The hummingbirds will feed on those long tubular flowers. And um, when, when there's a great nectar source, a male will set up a territory and he does this looping flight sort of kind of like a nighthawk um, and goes up and down and back up and up and back down. And he'll make a funny little noise when he does that. You can watch for that if you've got hummingbirds coming to your, um, your feeders. And so we went, when, when the, the male comes, he sets up the territory, he'll chase away other males. And the idea is to attract as many females as possible and mate with as many females as possible. And then the female goes off. She has a little tiny nest that's covered with lichen on the outside. She uses a spider web in it. Um, and then um, she'll incubate the eggs and feed the young. And when the young hatch, they have a little tiny short beak. You know, not that real long one. You can see it's, you know, it's longer than most baby birds but it's nowhere near as long as it's going to be. Uh, and then when the young can fly, they will go out and feed themselves. But when the, um, the hummingbird mother is feeding the youngsters, she's bringing a lot of insects. Insects is one of the important foods for baby birds, whether it's songbirds or hummingbirds. And so she brings in insects primarily. She may feed on nectar herself, and the young ones, once they fledge, may feed on nectar, but as they're growing, she's gonna be bringing them insects. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, um, Jess made a comment that her parents haven't seen as many hummingbirds so far this year. Um, 
I'll be uh, interested to hear if there are other hummingbird reports. Um, I'm relatively new at the house I'm in, and I've only ever had one hummingbird there at my um, at my little honeysuckle line. Uh, so I don't have a good sense of whether I have a, a lot or fewer hummingbirds. Um, I know that there's another plant um, that I grow in um, my plot at the community gardens, and that's bee balm. And the hummingbirds love it. And once that comes into bloom, it gives me an idea of um, how many sort of hummingbirds are around. But with the dryness, I'm sure some flowers um, are either delayed coming out or some plants aren't going to flower this year. So that may be a challenge for hummingbirds. But one of the things that hummingbirds do is they will go to sapsucker wells. Now, sapsuckers are a kind of woodpecker that make these little rows of holes all around the tree. Very even rows in different, you know, row upon row upon row of little holes. And it, it allows sap to flow and then insects get attracted to that sap. And the sap sucker comes along and feeds on both the insects and the um, sap. But the hummingbirds will also come and do the same thing and feed on some of the saps and, and the insects. And there's actually some thought that the northern range of hummingbirds is limited by the range of sap suckers. Uh, in the east, we have just the yellow-bellied sapsucker, uh, but it, it is all around in New Hampshire and in the state. Um, and I'm sure when it's dry like this, hummingbirds will be taking advantage of that nectar source and, well, food source, I guess, which means not really nectar, it's sap and insects. Um, but one of the things that that um, reminded me of the insects is that um, there are things you can do to help with insects in your in your yard. There would be bird food. So things to think about are that native plants in general host far more little caterpillar larvae than introduced non-native plants. And um, we had a terrific speaker, Doug Ptolemy, at our annual meeting, who has a book out about different plants and the research he's done on how many different kinds of insects are on um, different kinds of native plants. But little, the songbirds, you know, even chickadees that we think of as eating seed, they need insects for their youngsters, the warblers, um, rose-breasted grosbeaks, Orioles, any of those birds need insects for their youngsters, and the small caterpillars are a big source of food for these baby birds. So when you're thinking about plants in your yard, there's some great resources out there, but try to think about native plants that will have more of these little caterpillars on them and provide more food for our native birds. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions. Let me let me take them through one at a time. Uh, Susan asks, is it okay to have bird seed bird feeders up still? Yes, it's fine. There are a couple of things to, to be alert for. If you have bears in the neighborhood, then no, it's not fine to have your bird seed up because it will just continue to create problem bears. So unless you can keep the bears away from your bird feeders, it's best to maybe just scatter some seed on the ground. Uh, and wait until bears go into hibernation before you put um, full-fledged feeders back up again. Uh, the other thing is if you're putting out something like suet, suet can get oily and rancid, um, so you only want to put out just a very small amount, maybe one day's supply at a time, one or two days supply at a time. Particularly when it's a hot 90 degree weather, you may want to hold off a little bit on, on suet feed. Um, but bird seed, yes, it's fine to put that up. And hi, Scott. Bird trauma over the weekend. A fish crow raided my bluebird box. Wow, that's something new for me. Um, caging over the box. Let the bluebirds in and keep the crows out. Well, let's talk for a moment just about fish crows. 
um, because they're a relatively new species for the state. They've been moving northward and um, they're, I think about their northernmost town is Ossipee, New Hampshire, maybe up into Conway now. I think actually they have been reported in Conway, but there are none north of the White Mountains um, and very few over sort of in the northern Connecticut River Valley. Uh, so they're new species for the state and I'm not as familiar with them and I had no idea that crows of any kind would raid um, a nest box. Usually nest boxes are pretty safe from predators if you put predator guards on the pole below the box. That keeps mammals like raccoons and squirrels from coming up the post and raiding the box. Uh, and that can be pretty important because once a, a predator has found a box, it will come back over and over and over again in different years and just check it every year um, because it found food there once and it's gonna check it again. So you want a predator guard on the pole, but uh, I hadn't bumped into um, a fish crow or other bird raiding a box. So interesting, let me see what else. All right, I'm putting up, so Scott put some caging over the box. It lets the bluebird in, keeps the crows out. I'm surprised that the bluebirds actually continued um, after having been raided like that and had one, you know, two youngsters uh, taken. That's the kind of situation where sometimes the adults will abandon altogether out of fear for their own safety. Um, so maybe the fact that it, the adults weren't on the nest when the raid took place um, is meaning they're still coming back and feeding those, those other youngsters. Um, Scott, any advice on protecting the box a bit more? I think you've done really well to come up with some kind of caging that the, the bluebirds will actually go through. That's actually pretty impressive. Sometimes when you have a situation like that and you put something like screening over, it's, it's novel and new enough that the birds will not return to the nest site and they'll abandon it. Um, so I think you've done pretty well with that. I don't know if some kind of flagging, like a post with um, the kind of flags that you see at like used car dealers um, that flap in the wind. I don't know if that might help discourage a fish crow. Um, that's something I'd probably uh, need to do a little bit of research with some folks down south who might have a little more experience with fish crows um, and what what they do to get food. Um, but uh, I have not, I actually don't know of any other advice on any kind of bird predation of bird houses and cavities. All I know about are protecting them from mammals and snakes. So other birds, that's, um, that's interesting. Hmm. I wonder if that screening would also work to keep out some other kinds of predators. Hmm. Scott, I think you did a great job being creative like that because um, that's a challenge. And the fact that they're still feeding their young is great. Um, I would be surprised if, um, if they use that nest box again. You might want to move the nest box afterwards. Jess, thanks for hanging in there. Um, appreciate your, your joining us. Um, but yeah, Scott, you might want to... Um, want to move that nest box even if it was just a, a short distance uh, because the adults once they've been predated oftentimes don't return to the same nest spot again. Uh, I know with nighthawks when we study nighthawks if something happens that causes the nest to fail we've had predation we've had flooding um, it's about five years before they'll try that same site again so um, maybe doing something to change the location of the box once they finish nesting would be a good idea. I think that's good. I do want to mention um, Scott's point about um, the bluebird box uh, reminded me to, to talk about putting up boxes 
it is something that that you can do and often have birds come and use them. If you're in a wooded area, things like chickadees and white-breasted nuthatches and tufted titmice may use a box. House wrens use box in more suburban areas. Um, and uh, the wide open areas, like field areas, is where you could get tree swallows and, um, and bluebirds. The one couple of things you have to watch out for, predation we just talked about. You want to make sure you put a predator guard on a pole if you put the nest box up and make sure that squirrels can't jump to it from nearby bushes or trees. Uh, but you're also going to have to watch out for house sparrows. House sparrows are non-native sparrows. They nest in boxes. They're very persistent. They will kill adult um, birds that are incubating in the box. They'll poke holes in the eggs, they'll kill the youngsters. I've actually had um, troubles with them in my uh, garden plot here in Concord. I haven't solved it yet, um, but you definitely want to keep house sparrows from nesting in boxes. And if, if you can't do that, like me, you may need to cover over the holes or um, take the boxes down until you can figure out how to keep house sparrows out. Um, otherwise, you're just going to raise more house sparrows and they will take over all the boxes in the area. Uh, and unfortunately, that's what they're starting to do at the community gardens. So they can be a real pesky problem. Uh, if you don't have house sparrows, then you're lucky and you may have quite a few um, cavity nesting birds uh, in taking up your boxes. Uh, and one of the questions we get pretty often is that there are birds competing over the boxes. Um, so one of the things you can do is put two boxes close together. This works particularly well with bluebirds and tree swallows if you have an open area like that. Um, you can start with a couple of boxes about 10 feet apart and see if that will work because what happens is bluebirds will defend their box and the nearby box from other bluebirds, but they won't defend the other box from tree swallows. And sometimes you may, they may need to be closer together. Um, and you, you can even sometimes go as close as back to back and have tree swallows in one box and bluebirds in another box. Uh, okay, what else are people seeing out there? Oh, Scott said, yes, they're very skeptical of the new additions. One of the things about birds is that when they are feeding youngsters, it takes an awful lot to get them to abandon the nest. They've already invested a lot of time and energy into those youngsters, and the youngsters continue to make lots of cheeping noise, um, begging calls for them to feed them, for the calling for their parents to feed them. And those begging calls um, our strong incentive for the birds to continue to come in and feed the, the youngsters. So um, we were talking earlier about how you don't have to worry about putting a bird back up in the nest in terms of getting your ascent on your hand uh, onto the baby bird because most birds don't, don't smell. And um, they're going to continue to come back in and feed that youngster Unless, of course, you end up with a situation I mentioned before where the predator has has potentially gotten one of the adults or created enough fear that the um, adult birds will not return. So a couple of things, uh, practical things I want to mention. Again, it's Becky with New Hampshire Audubon. Uh, next week is the day before our holiday. And so we will not be having a live Facebook, but we'll plan to return in a couple of weeks, see what kind of questions are out there um, and what's happening in the natural world. Uh, I also wanted to mention um, that our Massabesic Audubon uh, Center trails are also open. I mentioned the McLean Center. Uh, Massapesic um, trails are open, but neither of the center buildings are open yet. Uh, we'll certainly let you know when that's happening. Uh, all right. 
We've got time for a few more little questions or comments, things happening. Um, I would uh, encourage you all to get your binoculars and start looking around for young birds. Um, sometimes uh, the young birds can look a little bit different than the adults. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about young robins, which have spots on their breast. So they don't look quite like the adults and they can be kind of confusing. Young bluebirds also have spots on their breast. So lots of young birds often are brown and streaky, or they may have a little bit of color, but not very much. They may have spots um, or lots of sort of mottled coloration and they can be a challenge to identify. And usually the best thing to do is watch and see what parent adult they're hanging out with. Because young birds will stay with the adults um, for, for quite a while. They'll gradually molt out of their juvenile plumage. And the robins will molt out of that spotted plumage on their breast and get the normal breast color. Um, but while they have that juvenile plumage, they're probably going to be pretty close to their parents still. They may be feeding themselves, or you may occasionally see the youngsters fluttering their wings and cheeping, and the adult will come in and feed it. And this is the time of year when this is starting to happen. Uh, I should also mention that birds will continue to, to nest um, well into July and even August for some species. Some birds, if they lose their first nest, will try again. In fact, many birds will do that, particularly if they lose their nest early in the season. They'll try a second time or sometimes even a third time. And other birds like Eastern Phoebes and Robins, their first nest is so early that they finish it, the youngsters are off on their own, and they will have a second brood and will be late nesting quite late into the end of August. So um, birds do continue to build their nests. And if you've got birds nesting right now in a spot that you don't want them to be, uh, make sure you cover that spot after they're finished nesting. Or as I mentioned, take down the wreath. Or if it's a Phoebe, maybe it's on a porch and you need to do some work on the porch. Once they've finished that, that nesting and the youngsters have left the nest, cover over the area, even if it's just temporary covering, so they don't get access and they can't try again. So I'm all about baby birds today. All right, thank you, Susan. Thanks for joining in. I appreciate everybody being here. It's Becky with New Hampshire Audubon. I apologize again for those technical difficulties. Um, let's see, I think I'm um, one for four with no technical difficulties. So we'll see if maybe next time in, uh, in a couple of weeks, um, I can try again and be without technical difficulties. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Take care and enjoy the birds in the natural world. Becky Swamala with New Hampshire Audubon signing off.